So when you're young, so we're talking about decisions, you know, you, when you're young, you have a lot of different little decisions and they kind of grow as age and so on and so forth grows. So when you're a kid, you know, what to wear or what to play with, you know, what to eat, you know, those are, I mean, you have to choose what to eat throughout your whole life. But, you know, that's one little thing, uh, kind of a smaller decision. So we have decisions all throughout the lives. What friends to make, um, what to do in life, that's one of the ones, you know, farther on to do with school, that, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of decisions in life, and, and God wants us to make good decisions. Um, he has the decisions that we should make. There's a beautiful quote um, that talks about, it's in Desire of Ages 688.4. I'm sure you all have probably heard this quote, it says, those who decide to do nothing in any line to displease God will know after presenting their case before him just what course to pursue. You know, that's beautiful. That's saying that if we lay our case before the Lord, he will show us exactly what his will is for our life. Now, what does it mean to lay your case before the Lord? Any, any ideas? You guys can go ahead and say something. I know my dad probably knows because he's the one that goes over that, well, he's talked about that before, but uh, any ideas? What is, what, what could be a practical way of laying your case before the Lord? Pray. Definitely, going to the Lord in prayer, that is, that is a definite, definite one. Maybe one more, any other, any other ideas? How can you lay your case before the Lord? Maybe if you have like a really good excuse for why. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I was like, where is that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Indeed, indeed. Well, this is a very practical thing. What you can do is you can write out, prayerfully write out the pros and the cons. Let's say, oftentimes, you know, all of us, by God's grace, we want to do right. And sometimes there'll be a decision between, oh, this, something, you know, one thing or another, and they both seem good. But so it's one thing that can help is write out the pros and cons of each and prayerfully look over those. And God can use that. I'll t be talking about more about how God's used that in my life later on. But that's one thing. You know, there's a verse that's in uh, Psalms 37. It says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee de the desires of thine heart. And it continues on. It says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust ye also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Commit thy way. It's sort of a similar concept. We have to lay our care. Lay it. Well, yeah, lay our cares too, but I <laughs> wasn't talking about that. Lay the things, the decisions we want to make, lay those before God. He, he wants to direct us in those things. And as my brother Dylan mentioned, prayer, that is totally key. In fact, there is a quote that says, okay, okay so, so it starts, Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant, reluctant to pray when prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse? Where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence? Without unceasing prayer and diligent watching, we are in the danger of growing careless and deviating from the right path. So when we're not praying, we're not obviously seeking God's will first, and we can deviate from those things that the Lord would have us do. You know, there's another verse, I'm sure all of you know this one, James 1.5 says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, ask of God that giveth all to all men liberally, and unbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So when we ask for wisdom, it says that God will give it. Now that's wisdom, not only just wisdom as in, you know, knowledge, so on and so forth, but wisdom in making decisions. He wants to give us that wisdom. And another big one is we have to have faith in God's leading. And um, that's one thing that God has taught me in some ways in life, and it's been a blessing. So I have a question before we get into that. Um, what, it, what comes to your, you all's mind when you think of faith? You know, we always throw it around here, oh, we need have faith, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we're like, okay, how does this work out practically in our lives? What are some practical examples of faith in our lives? Any ideas? Go ahead. That's right. That's, indeed, that's an act of faith right there. Taking action, indeed. All right, maybe one more. Go ahead. Mm, I like that. Mm. 
That's right. That's right. Confidence in God's word. That is a powerful one. I'll take one more. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. That's right. Trusting fully in him and what he can do in the situation, not, oh, humanly I can't do this. Probably can't, but through God, he can, he can supply that. Uh, I once heard it, well, of course, we know the verse, faith, uh, now faith, uh, Hebrews 11.1. 11, 1, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Now, that's a beautiful verse. Now, one time I heard it, um, faith expressed as three things, and I'll explain it. So first, number one, faith, before you can have faith in something, you have to have knowledge in it. For instance, if I don't know about, okay, let's say I'm an evolutionist, evolutionist. If I don't know about evolution, how am I going to have faith in that it's true? You can't. So that's one thing. So first we have to know about it. Second, believe. Even though, you know, there ev- some people believe in evolution, I don't personally. So you can know about something and still not believe in it, but the part is when the, the part where the rubber meets the road is the trusting part. And that's where we run into issues. You know, we can say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus. I have knowledge in Jesus. I know Jesus, or I know about Jesus. But trusting him in our day-to-day lives, that is where really the rubber hits the road. And that is where um, the devil tries to get in and, oh, you can't trust him in this. I mean, this part of the life, yeah, you got that. But uh, that one, just tell, just tell God, uh, yeah, I, I got this one. But we, knew, we need to be trusting in the Lord. Um, some of you all know, um, in December, actually, I guess it was January of 2016, I was a GYC. This is right. I graduated in 2015 from high school, so I had had one semester of college, and um, so I was going to my second semester of college. This is January 1, 2016, at GYC, and I was sitting in my room there in the hotel and talking to my family. And literally, this thought came to mind. It was like the Lord was impressing me to do mission work, like right now, like with it as soon as possible before I, I, I continued on with college. And at first. If you would have asked me to the very end of December, any time before that, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going back to Washington College this next semester, and um, I'll be doing that, you know. I had no idea, but the Lord impressed me. At first, I'm like, okay, maybe this is just sometimes, you know, you have random thoughts and whatever, and I don't know, just random things. And I was like, okay, maybe this is just a random thought. Well, the more I thought about it and prayed about it, uh, I felt like God was leading that way. So then the next day, which was Saturday night, at UIC, there's a lot of booths and exhibits and so on and so forth. I was like, Lord, okay, and one other, one other thing is, um, college started the 5th. This is the 1st of January. So college started in like four days. And so it's not like I have a lot of time to look around and see where the Lord was leading me. And so I was like, Lord, if this is truly you, like, I need to know, can you show me in these booths? There's many ministries in those, in those exhibits. And so I started walking around. I was probably going for like an hour, talking to all sorts of people, Middle East, Asia, different places, um, you know, their projects that they were doing. And they're like, it's kind of short notice. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But uh, then there was this one place, it said, reach Nepal, and I'm thinking, hmm, reach Nepal, what is, what, Nepal, let me think, I think they have some tall mountains there, I mean, we don't really know a lot about Nepal, right, and so I was, I was looking there, it had a little video showing, and, and then I asked the guy, because I wanted to do like a three or four months, you know, longer term, not just like a little mission trip, like a few weeks, I wanted to live there for a few months, and so I asked him, I was like, ah, I'll just ask him, I was like, so how long would a mission trip be, and he's like, oh, you know, three or four weeks or something like that, I'm like, oh, man. Because this was basic, that was literally, I'm get, I was getting ready to go back to my, my dorm room. It was getting later and everything, or, or the hotel. And so this is almost like the last chance. And then, and then the Lord impressed me, okay, ask him just a few months. Ask him what, just see what, he, see what he'll do. And so I asked him, I was, and I was thought for sure, you know. You, m- normally places, you know, they have more of a schedule. And you can't just like go whenever, you know. But uh, I asked, I said, so what about, you know, three or four months or something like that? Oh, he's like, oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah. I'm like, oh, mercy, this might be the place. And so um, then we went, got back on a Monday. We drove back, and, well, he gave me the guy's number that lived in Nepal, and we called him up, and by God's grace, doors started opening. And by the fit, by the 6th, I think it was a Thursday, if I remember correctly. Uh, anyways, by a Thursday, I got my ticket to go to Nepal. And it was amazing to see how God, I had no idea of that at all, but God led me to do that. And over there, one other cool thing about that experience is I could see God's providence in the whole situation. I'm also before, I, before that I hadn't been a ton into media, like a year or so before, 
But then um, about a year leading up to that, I, was, I got a camera, I started doing more videography, photography, and so on and so forth. And that's what I was doing over there. So it was so cool how God prepared me for that, that time there when I was in Nepal. I was working with a Christian TV um, program and editing and filming and, and stayed in an orphanage, all sorts of things. It was, a, it was a tremendous blessing going over there, learned a lot. But it was just amazing to see how God can lead so quickly if we let him. Now, during the process of deciding, I did do that. I, I prayed and I was, I was journaling out the pros and cons. Lord, do you really want me to go? Is there, what, what, how could I gain from this? You know, how, how could this be detrimental? Or, you know, all those sorts of things. And by God's grace, he pointed to that. And it was amazing to see how God can lead and gives hopes for the future. You know, he wants to lead us in every part of our lives if we allow him to. And um, there's a verse found, there's so many beautiful promises in the Bible. Well, the, also the, the whole chapter, uh, sorry, the whole book, chapter, sorry, Hebrews 11, chapter 11, and that goes over the men and women that have lived faithful lives and also have shown faith. It's called the faith chapter, and it's amazing. That, that is a very encouraging chapter to see how people, by God's grace, if they live by faith, he will bring them far and do great things in their lives. And um, there's some beautiful passages. Some of my favorite are... Um, there is one in Proverbs 3. We actually sang that one. I'll just read it real quickly. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understandings. We can't lean on our own decision, make, decision making. We have to lean on what Christ can do for us. And in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. That's a promise right there. So, the, so basically the steps we've gone over, the first one, you guys remember what it was? The first thing we talked about? We talked about laying our case before the Lord. Does that ring a bell? All right, the second one was pray. As Brother Dylan mentioned, pray for guidance. God wants to guide. And then the next one was we have to have faith that God will guide us. And that trusting, that's the main key. Trust that God will give you that, that truth and that, and that decision and help you know what, is, what, what he would have you do. And the last one I'd like to talk about is take action. Once you know God's leading, don't be like, okay, I know what you want me to do, God, but I'm just going to like chill here or, you know, not just basically do nothing. When God calls you to do something, take action. There's a, a quote in Christian leadership. It says, I've been shown that the most signal victories and the most fearful defeats have been in the turn of minutes. God requires promptness of action. Delays, doubts, hesitation, and indecision frequently give the enemy every advantage. So it's during that time where we might wait just a little bit, the devil's like, yes, this is my chance. Maybe I can still, you know, have a foothold in his life. So when God calls you, take action, brothers and sisters. And I'd just like to read one more verse, one more quote, and then we'll close. Psalms 32, 8, it says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou should go. I will guide thee with my eye. These are promises we can claim. When we're wanting, needing to make decisions, God will help us in those if, if we allow him to. And these are, I just want to bring out a few things that I've learned, um, other things in life. Bloom where you're planted. What I mean by that is sometimes we get in the mentality, mentality okay, I'm going I'm to say this, especially in academy, that somewhere else, wherever it may be, is grass is greener on the other side. Like, if only I was here. Oh, if only I could be there. Listen, I dealt with that. I think we all have at some point. But listen, folks, live life to the fullest where you're at. Enjoy life where you're at. God has you there for a purpose. Now, if he's leading you somewhere else and you know that for sure, you go. But if you're just like, eh, you know, I don't like this one thing, so I just, eh, you, that's better about that place or whatever, be happy where you're at. But like I said, if God calls you to go somewhere, you go. But uh, that's, that's one thing. Another thing is, um, you know, sometimes in life, we, uh, another reason why people might want to go somewhere else, they're like, ah, you know, that place might be better. But sometimes they're trying to run from themselves, as it were. They don't like maybe the decisions they've made or so, something of that nature in their life at one place, and they want to kind of leave it behind. This is the thing. You can't leave yourself. You might try. Yourself can't leave you either. So you're going to be stuck with yourself no matter what. So by God's grace, if you surrender yourself to Christ and let him work in your life, you can be happy with yourself as well and uh, live life to the fullest in that extent. Now, I just want to read one last thing here. It is from Christ's Object Lessons. This is a powerful quote. 
says, he gives every, sorry, yeah, he gives to every man his work. Each has his place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. And listen to this part specifically. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in heavens, heavenly mansions, then is a special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. So that is saying that God has a specific place for every one of you all to work for God. And you, you're working for God by God's grace in school as well. So he has a place for you in school to work for God, also in life after that. But um, So I just want to leave you all with that. Trust God. He will help you in decisions. And once he has pointed in the direction that he wants you to go, take action. Don't wait. Because the devil just wants to use that little time in there to mess around, as it were. So let's let God guide our lives. Trust in him. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you in prayer. Thank you new that you're a God that uh, is an amazing orchestrator of events. Lord, you know how history is gone. You know that uh, man in and of ourselves, we have wisdom that equals nothing. Lord, I pray that we would trust in you in every decision that we have to make and uh, know that as we let you rule in our lives, you will lead us to those decisions we need to make, Lord. And may you guide us in our lives. Thank you. Bless us this evening and uh, evermore. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone. Um, Nathan, of course, was sharing a little bit his thoughts and experience on decision making, something that we all have to do and, and by God's grace, learn to do well. And so hopefully you've got some things to, to work with. Um, these young adults have made decisions as well. They made decisions to be here. Some of those decisions were easy. Uh, some of those were a little bit more challenging. And so we've got several questions that we're going to ask them just to kind of give you an opportunity to hear it directly from students, why they're here. And also, if you have questions that you would like to ask, please have those ready, OK? So here we go. Um, just so that everybody could get acquainted with you, let's ask uh, if you would share your name, share where you're from, and also what your field of study is. Okay, Shastina, if you'd start. As he said, my name is Shastina. <laughs> I'm from Michigan, and I'm studying elementary education. My name is Nalo. I am from California, and I'm studying elementary education. My name is Jomana. I'm from New York and Florida, and I'm studying personal evangelism. My name is Daniel. I'm from Colorado, and I'm studying theology. Marcelino from Texas, business. OK, wow. Can you see? This is a very um, spread out group from Michigan to California to so forth. So there must be something about this little backwoods spot in Arkansas that has drawn you here. And that's our next question is, why did you decide to come to OH? OK? Marcelino, yours is probably going to be one of the easier ones. So why don't you start? Okay. I was in the academy for two years. And I didn't think I'd be back at the college. But for many reasons, uh, the Lord had wanted me here for one more year. And so here I am. I had been praying. Uh, in my freshman year in high school, God had told me he wanted me to be a pastor. And uh, OHC had come up, I think it was through my teen's wife. And I was just praying about it, and I was asking God to lead me. And as I was talking with Miss Magda on the phone uh, just last year, I just felt this peace and a surety that God wanted me to come here. Um, I didn't want to come here. <laughs> uh, I had some friends that actually came here previously. You probably know a few of them. There's Dominique Nelson, Elder Preval, and Eugene Preval. Um, they had told me about this school when I first decided to give my life to Christ in 2014. But I, my mindset was different then, and canvassing for school tuition sounded crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not knocking on people's doors and asking for money. 
I'm good on that, and I'm not sleeping on church floors. You know, I didn't understand the concept of, of canvassing, that it wasn't about raising money for school, but it was about winning souls for the kingdom. So I put it off for almost two years, and the thought kept coming up, but in 2016, that summer, um, it was as if they were being more aggressive with me coming here, and I'm just like, leave me alone, I don't wanna come here. But I say, you know what, I'll check the website and see about the school, and as I began to look at the school, actually look at the website, I started to get drawn to the school, but I still was putting it off because I didn't want to go to college, and I remember um, calling the school and speaking to Miss Magda. At the time, I had no idea who she was, and she was telling me about the school, and I was telling her my worries about you know ACT and SAT scores and not having the 1500 to, um, give to the school, and she was trying to encourage me that many students come here by faith and they go go through and they're able to um, graduate perfectly fine. But I kept putting it off, but finally last year in November, the Lord literally, through many providential um, events, moved me here. Um, a part of me was like, I wish I would have came sooner, but I know God's timing is perfect, and now I actually want to be here. I um, mean, I praise God for that, that he can give us that change of heart, and that's how I ended up here. We're glad you're here, too. Each one of you. Uh, would you like the short answer or a long answer? <laughs> or medium? medium. Okay. <laughs> um, I, was, I initially planned to be a massage therapist, and I enrolled to Weimar. But in order for me to enroll Weimar, they required a good amount of money for like a deposit. And the, I only had two months to raise that much money. It was $3,000 for, uh, for my deposit. And the only way that I knew I could raise that money was canvassing. And I didn't know of any programs that would canvass in November, December. My aunt told me about a program that canvasses in the winter. And so I decided to sign up. I canvassed with them. And the students there, uh, I was really impressed by their, of how they were all spiritually um, driven and motivated um, to canvas. Because personally for me, I kind of like to canvas and sometimes I would rather just not canvas. But um, this was a time where the Lord was calling me and I had to make a decision fast before the next year would come or else I would be going back home, which is um, the islands in American Samoa. And I decided to apply, and I told myself, I have nothing to lose. I might as well just apply. I applied late, and that's when I knew if I get accepted, then this would be the, the Lord's will for me. As you can see, I got accepted. Um, at first, I didn't want to come. It was more of like, this is my only option, so I'll just take it. Um, but this second semester, the atmosphere and the staff and the students have impressed me, so I'm back here again. So this is the short answer. <laughs> um, I was debating among many different schools, and one of my friends that some of you know, David Ponyo, he was my canvassing leader for a couple years, and he shared this quote with me. I can give you the reference later, and it basically says that when we take a long time in making decisions, it wearies the angels. And I was like, oh, and I was like, why did you tell me this? Now I have to decide, like, right now. And so he was like, Shestina, just pray about it and make a decision with the best of the knowledge that God has given you. And if you make the wrong decision, God is going to make that clear. And I was like, oh. So I sat down the next day, and I made a pros and cons list between the different schools I was debating and OH1. <laughs> and so um, through prayer and Bible study, I decided I was going to come here. And each day that I've been here, God has made it more clear this is definitely where he wants me to be. You know, I, I get the picture that none of you are kind of just looking for a place to coast. I mean, there's some sense of you being here with a purpose. Um, my, my next question is, OK, so you're here. You got here. And you've kind of spent a little time. Has what about your expectations? Have has it met your expectations? What what would you say about that? Are you disappointed? Are you does it exceed your expectations? What what can you say about that? Expectations as in the spiritual life, academic. In terms of what you came what you came for here. Oh. Yeah. Uh, let me think. <laughs> okay, Daniel. I know for me, absolutely. Um, I wanted to go to a college 
that would provide me with a spiritual atmosphere that will help me grow uh, and know Jesus <clears throat> know Jesus better, especially as being a pastor. You need to have a personal walk with God, and I wanted the best atmosphere, the best education I could find, and the Lord led me here. Others? Marco. So, so yeah, it's a... It disappointed. College is not as easy as people graduating from high school expect it to be. Um, and I think that is especially true here at OHC. Um, all the other people in my class when I graduated academy have gone to uh, different Adventist colleges. And one of my, my best friend, Marcus, he's going studying Andrews, and we both have accounting class. And hearing his description of accounting class and my description, uh, my class is harder and more in-depth, and I've been able to explore it uh, more entirely and understand it deeper. And so from an academic standpoint, I can say that uh, OHC does not disappoint. It is definitely up to par. Thank you. I appreciate that because, you know, often students come because of the spiritual emphasis, but um, you found that we work hard academically as well. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. No. Oh. Um, OHC, how do you say? I had expectations, but OHC went above my expectations, and I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> and I thought I was hardcore in spirituality, but yeah, OHC beat me to it. <laughs> um, the classes, the classes are interwoven the bible is interwoven with the practical life that we live and not only that it's also and from the classes that i take i can take something from each of my classes and apply it to when i go canvassing and that's what that's what i didn't think of my expectations was we're required to go to worship everyone reads their bible their devotions everyone's supposed to be spiritual and as I have said before, OEC has gone way beyond my expectations. And um, it has reminded me that my expectations are not the same as God's expectations and God's standards. Um, for me, I guess it, it would also be above. I remember like the first week when I was here and I was going through the classes and I was talking to my parents and my friend on the phone and I was like, you wouldn't believe it. Like, in the class, we like sit and discuss the Bible and then we write an essay on it. It's so cool. And then like all my classes, my intro to teaching class, it's all about how Jesus teaches. And I just thought that was so cool how it was interwoven, you know, like Nalo said, in every class. So that was amazing. Yeah, I'll th you, you will definitely find that the, the worldview, Christ's worldview is what's represented here. And uh, I'm glad you got it. You're getting it. Um, canvassing. I heard the magic word pop up. Canvassing. What, um, what about canvassing? Has canvassing been a challenge? So this three weeks I canvassed this semester was my first time, my first foray into canvassing. I'd never done it before. Um, and so I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't really know about canvassing before I came to OHA. I heard about it. This is my first taste. And it's challenging and rewarding uh, at the exact same time. You will, you will see God use your feeble efforts on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's something you don't get to see in everyday life. When you see the great controversy worked out in front of you, and you see your place in it, you can come back to school with a better focus. It's no longer day-to-day -day life. Every day is a battle. And it's your role, it's your responsibility to God to take your place and to, uh, and to fight. Be part of that great controversy, yes. Um, so, like I had said, one of the things that turned me off from coming here was canvassing. Because <clears throat> at the time I didn't know, really know what that was fully, and it just sounded like begging for money. And I don't like to beg. <laughs> um, but canvassing, actually, it has challenged me. But what's interesting about canvassing is when you first go into canvassing, you're super excited. You're like, oh, this is going to be so fun. Oh, my goodness. We're going to go and sleep at a church. And it's going to be like a big slumber party. And woo! 
So, you know, you have that first initial, like, adrenaline rush. Because, like, I remember the first day I canvassed, um, I was in Alabama, and I canvassed a deaf person. And I came back home, and I was like, I canvassed a deaf person. It was so fun. And, like, as the week went by, I'm like, oh. I got rejected a lot today, and then the week went by. I'm like, I got three books out today, and I kind of am ready to go back to school now. You know, um, Canvas to really show me who I was, and I think that's where the challenge comes from because you think that you have your canvas down pat, you're putting the book in the hand, you're smiling, you're praying, you're walking fast, and that's just gonna, that's the magic, you know, that's like the little cherry on top that's gonna make everything work. But then you realize that canvassing shows you your weakness and your defects, and doing all that does not guarantee that you'll be successful. And the challenge has come from the spiritual challenge because what many may not realize is canvassing is not a vacation. I was actually talking with a student about that the other day. Um, it's not a vacation. It's, you're truly on the battlefield for Jesus Christ, but it's, like Marcelino said, very rewarding because you, it says in the Bible, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. And that's what I think about canvassing. You know, when I get home at the end of that night and my feet are killing me, and I'm just like, I wish someone could rub these things right now. And I'm like, someone massage my back. I'm like, you know what, Lord? I can sleep with a sweet rest because I know I put my all in. And even if I just got out two books today, it was worth it because I put my all in. You know, so canvassing showed me that, that the challenge is not doing the canvassing work itself, but the challenge is you. You know, how much are you willing to put out to receive for the kingdom of Christ? Because... I mean, God's going to give the money for school anyway. He's called us here. I know he's called me here, so that's the least of my worries. Yeah. But the true thing, the true challenge is, am I growing spiritually? And sometimes canvassing challenges my spiritual walk. I'm just like, am I getting closer to God or further from him? Because there's just too much going on. But then the Lord shows me at the end of the programs that I'm, I'm growing closer to him, and that's where the challenge comes it's for myself. We, we love to see you students go out, and we love to see you come back. And we definitely notice changes all the time. The Lord does amazing things. Anybody else on canvassing? Yeah. I know for me it was really my first time canvassing, and I was uh, I was challenged. I could see that the devil was working really hard to try to stop us from going out door to door. He was he was trying to discourage us in every way that he possibly could, but I could see that God was working harder and that He was working in our team, and I was just so blessed to to uh, see the unity in our team, to see that God was bringing us together in unity with him. And it was just so exciting to see people who, who needed these books, the books that talk about God and how to know him better. It's just like, when they get that, it's such a satisfying feeling because you know that God has put you at that place at that time for a purpose. It's not just some coincidence. And there's too many that happen. And it's like, wow, God is so real and so good to us. Yeah, thank you for bringing that out. You're, you're not just going for character transformation. You're going out to reach people. And uh, it's beautiful that we don't just stay in this little backwoods corner here. We go out into the trenches uh, constantly. Now, what about some things? Uh, I've just got a couple more questions for you. What about things that you enjoy here on campus or being part of? Are there special activities or special classes that you know, you've been blessed with? OK. <clears throat> I love it here. Like, I really do. It's so funny, because I did not want to come here. And I always laugh at myself. I'm like, the Lord has such a sense of humor. He's like, you don't even know what you're rejecting. It's kind of like canvassing. They're like, no, no, we don't want it. I'm like, but it's the most awesome thing ever. Like, you'd be so happy if you just got this book, I promise. But it's like, psh, slam the door in the face. I'm like, hey, whatever. And I think that was me. Like, I, when I was being canvassed to come here, I was just rejecting it. I'm like, no, 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 I don't want it. But it's like, it's, it's fun, I promise. And one of the things I enjoy about here is just the atmosphere, being in nature. That's like the biggest thing for me because I love nature and being able to hike like to the ridge and to the bluffs and you you have such a a freedom to just hear God's voice in nature, to spend that time with him. And a lot of times I was sharing with the, the Nieves not too long ago, I'll go to the lake over here, Lake Harriet, and they're building the girls' college dorm and it's not up yet. And sometimes I'll just go there and just sit there and. It, I can't explain it. You just have to experience it yourself. But that's something that I really enjoy. It's like a whole nother atmosphere, even though it's right there. And that's a beautiful thing that I enjoy. And I enjoy the fact that everyone here is just, it's like a big family. We're all diverse from different places, different countries, different backgrounds. But we just all get along. And there's not like this 
line of demarcation between the academy and the college. It's like just a, a blend. And, and I, I, I love that about here. Another activity I enjoy is being able to do ministry while you're in school. The canvassing, um, the acts yeah. team, sharing messages, Friday nights, if college can share messages, song service. It's, it's a well-rounded education in that regards. You're not stuck in your books. You're able to use those talents. And a lot of talents I did not know I had until I came here. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know I can do that. And I find myself playing guitar. And sometimes I'll be like, I play a guitar. Like, that's so weird. You know, but being here in this environment has blessed me with that. So that's something I really enjoy about OHC. Go ahead. Mind if I, she mentioned acts real quick. And I wanted to... <clears throat> bring that up. One of the biggest stereotypes at large Adventist universities is uh, university churches. Right? They have just the kind of cliche around them. I don't need to go into that. But the ACTS program is something really special. Um, you find that your smallest talents can bless people so immensely. And being able to go to a little church, I go to umpire church, and on a good Sabbath there will be 10 people besides, or including the people that go from the college. And I didn't come from a church that small. I doubt most of you came from a church that small. Um, but being able to go and say, well, I took a year and a half of piano in high school, and that's a year and a half more than anyone else, so yes, I'll do special music. Um, it, it pushes you, it makes you grow. And you can see that no matter what the Lord has given you, it can be a blessing to people. And so that's one thing that's been valuable to me is the Acts program. Okay. Nobody's mentioned anything about classes. Classes are <laughs> kind of duds. What, what's going on with classes? <laughs> I can go ahead. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about Acts, too. <laughs> so I go to the prison ministry, and I've been super blessed. We've been doing a Bible studies series called steps to Christ and we've been going through each chapter and it's just so amazing to see the prisoners how they receive the message and they just come out there and they're like wow you know God is so real and personal and that's what I love about the truth that we have is that we can display it and and show them that it is possible to have a relationship with Jesus and it's such an awesome thing and and then on top of that you can talk to them about other other things and tell them about how Jesus is mentioned in this and oh it's just such a big blessing and seeing people come to know the truth better now in regards to classes one of my favorites even though it's kind of challenging at times is massage class because I want to be able to help minister to people and I understand that we are starting up a lifestyle center and the, the fact that I can have this training will help me able to be a partake of that and to bless others through that because a massage really leads to a lot of things. People won't necessarily pray with you all the time, but if you give them a massage, you can ask to pray with them and they'll be like, well, I mean, you're kind of giving me a massage, so I guess so. <laughs> and so it opens up a lot of doors. Neat. One more question. OHC is not for everyone. And um, so my last question for you would be, what kind of a person would benefit most from coming here? OHC is not for everyone, but it is for those who see their need in their spiritual life, and it is also for those who want to grow in Christ even more. And you will have challenges everywhere you go. I have my own challenges, but... OHC, you, have, you choose to come here because you see your need. And not only that, you also choose to come here because you love outreach. You love to share the gospel. And not only that, you want to surrender all to Christ. Um, the second time I came, I came because I wanted to make a change in my life. The person who would benefit most from this is the person who chooses, who willingly chooses to come here and that you are led by God. If you are not led by God, go where God leads you. Because as you can see, OHC is very small, but its influence has gone wide over the United States. We don't even know how all of these people know or, or even heard of OHC. I'm from California. My, nobody here knows who my aunt is. And I asked her, how do you know about OHC? She said, 
she's a good friend of Beth Hill. And, and I asked everyone around here, and they said, I don't even know her. And so <laughs> the person who would benefit most is the person who sees that Christ is leading you here. As you can see, most of us here has all been led by Christ. And if we were not led by Christ, we would have been gone already. Because this, is a, this school, you choose to come here. You're not forced to come here. Well, for the college, mostly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anybody else? No, we're good. Let me, um, let me make a comment. Oh, did you? No. Let me make a comment. Um, we don't, you, you know, you've come, you've seen, those of you that are visiting, no gymnasium, no se uh, student center, uh, no five-course uh, cafeteria, no, uh, you know, the list is long of things we don't have. Let me tell you what we do have here. I was uh, called to uh, take a, d a delivery of some appliances for the new houses that we have up on the hill. And there were three men that were in this big truck <clears throat> and they were delivering, you know, these things. And uh, while they were doing that, one of them looked at me kind of curiously and he said, what is this place, you know? And I said, well, it's a school. And he, yeah, but what, what kind of school? And I said, well, it's a Christian school. And uh, we have a college and we have a, an academy. He says, oh, really? You know, I've been thinking about college and school. And, uh, you know, we just chatted and so forth. And he, after a while, he looked at me and he said, and he just kept kind of looking around. And he said, there's something unusual about this place. He said, there's like a, a, like a spirit here, a good spirit. <laughs> These were his words, you know? And he said, there was like a really good spirit. And he went to his guy, you know, guys, don't you feel it? There's the good spirit. They're kind of you know, and so forth. And he said that three or four times. And when he was leaving, you can tell he was kind of wistful, kind of like, I want to come back. We pray that the Spirit of the Lord is here. And um, we're all human here. We're, we're very real people, aren't we? None, nobody goes around with a halo here, <laughs> anything like that. A little where there's no wings sprouting or anything like that. But, uh, but it is a place where Jesus meets us and where very, very special things happen. And so thanks for sharing. We appreciate it. May the Lord continue to bless. Everyone. Oh. Yeah, OK. Please, what are your questions? We've got a couple of minutes. Don't be shy. Who will be first? OK. Do we have one? No, I missed. OK, right here. Okay, we're just going to take a minute so that she can, this way everybody will hear the question. If, uh, no, no, yeah, just repeat, repeat your question. All right. Um, hello? Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, so when it comes to, like, the schedule, does it ever get, like, feel like too much, or do you get used to it pretty quick? Because I'm just visiting, and I'm exhausted, so. <laughs> wow. I'll tell you what, you just... You have just zeroed in on our Achilles heel. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, this schedule is too much if you're not using your time well. Um, you will learn how to work smarter and harder and in times you didn't think existed at OHA. Um, but that is one of the most useful skills you can have in your life. OHC, OHA, schedules are both busy. Um, here, go ahead. <laughs> well, I came from Daystar Adventist Academy. We kind of have a similar schedule. We just don't have as, as much homework. <laughs> oh, man, so much homework. <laughs> and, and really, I th it just comes down, if the Lord leads you here, you just got to pray about the schedule that he wants you to establish because if you do it in your own way, it will make life harder. Well, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. <laughs> so the schedule, definitely, yes, it's too much. 
but you gotta have you gotta learn the science behind it and you also have to find your your way your cracks within the schedule and you as as mentioned if you don't use your time wisely you're gonna fall way behind but so that's why i like it here because i don't like to be idle and it my schedule prevents me from being very lazy. And if I'm lazy, I'm just, I'm not gonna do anything, do nothing. And that's when the, the, the devil creeps in and that's when you do things you don't wanna do. And so, praise Lord for the schedule. <laughs> Question right back here. Oh, can I quickly comment on that? Um, Go ahead. If you were, and I want an answer from everyone, <laughs> but, um, how would you rate the difference between your spiritual walk with Christ before you came here and where, how you are now? Well, how would you describe the, the difference in your spiritual walk with Christ? Hello, is it on? Oh, Go ahead. okay. I like that question. Um, I, I can, pers for me personally, I can say that I have grown spiritually coming here. Um, before I came here, I, the, there was one thing I believe that Jesus or yeah that Christ needed to reveal to me that he knew could only be revealed to me by coming here and that's righteousness by faith Amen. I had no idea what that was I didn't know what 1888 was I'm like Jones and Wagner the only thing I knew about Jones was that he helped the Sunday law not pass but other than that I had no idea that righteousness by I never I didn't understand that the foundation of that I never knew what that was so I learned about that January February of this year my first semester into coming into the second semester. And it has been a complete just paradigm shift in my mindset of walking with God. It's just so different now. You know, you can say Jesus is my best friend because now I realize that there's nothing in us that we can do to be holy or have salvation. And coming here, I've learned that and mentioning classes, I learned that taking a class called Adventist Heritage. And in this class, we go through the history of our faith. And that has actually helped solidify me in this faith, seeing what we have gone through. I, you know, the Bible says that they will come into a settling of the truth. And I believe coming here has helped me come into a settling of the truth, that nothing can shake my foundation. By God's grace, you know, through Christ, that nothing will shake me. And I can say that that's because of coming here. And of course, the atmosphere. You know, what we, I've learned is nowhere you go is going to change you. Your environment can't make you holy. In these last days, there's going to be people in the city that are walking with God that will be in heaven and those in the country that will be lost and they will go into eternal damnation. But it's a choice. And he, being here, you, you, the distractions are limited. So you're able to allow God to empower your choice because you don't have all those side distractions. But it's not to stay here in the backwoods and not go out. Now that you've grown spiritually, you take that out and you share that with others. To be brief. OHC will not increase your spirituality. It is a catalyst to your spirituality. Being here by yourself won't do anything. I mean, you'll, you'll learn a lot more, but your personal relationship won't increase unless you put effort forward, obviously. But if you put that effort forward, the environment is such that you can grow and it encourages spiritual growth. And so it takes, it takes your own effort. I, I've been in the academy and just not put forth the effort and not any change. But as soon as you put forth that effort, the change is uh, incredible. And also, it keeps you from getting spiritually fat. I've grown up in the church listening to sermons every Sabbath. But you come here, and you listen to Vespers and prayer meeting, and then you go canvassing and apply it. And you're, you go to Acts, and you apply it. And that gaining of knowledge and application, that's where you see the most strength. Strength to resist temptation is best gained through active service. Thank you. I saw a hand over here. Oh, no? Okay, right here. All right, I thought so. Just for my question, Mason, um, my mom always told me growing up, like... You're good. You're good. We're here. <laughs> my mom always told me growing up, if you're ever going to learn from someone, make sure they're who you want to become, because you become like who you learn from. Do you guys, knowing your teachers, do you want to become like them? Uh, I know for me personally, um, there has been quite a few teachers that have impacted my life. Uh, pr but prior to coming here, it, it had been kind of hard for me because throughout academy, I never really 
felt like I had, we were so busy and so limited on staff. I never really felt like I'd go out to the staff, but then there's no students that are really spiritual. So I had to be the spiritual leader. I had to bring it in. But I felt like no one ever gave me Bible studies. No one ever led me this way. I had to do personal study and was like, oh man, I just wish someone else could help me, help me along my journey further, my, help me learn how to further my walk with Christ as a mentor. And I found quite a few mentors here. They've definitely been a blessing to me. Definitely. Each and every one of my teachers, I, I like to analyze people. And each one of my teachers, I've taken something from them, and I've put it in my list where I put, OK, they do this, so I want to put this when I, when I start teaching. I want to do this when I start teaching. One of my teachers I appreciate about them is that they, if you get the wrong answer, they'll work with you. They're not going to put you on the, on the spot. They're not going to tell you, uh, no, that's not the right answer. No, no, no. But they understand that it is the wrong answer, but they'll help you to see it. And not only that, they take the time to listen to you. So each one of my teachers, they have impacted me positively. That's a relief. <laughs> Anybody else? OK, um, I think now we're, we're ready for the question in the corner. Okay. <laughs> this question especially applies to those who know me, so personally know me. <sighs> yeah. So I've been here over five different school years in the academy. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. I, I don't have any desire to come to college here. Um, and I plan to take different majors than are offered here. Um, from, from your standpoint, why should I come here? You, you couldn't give me something easy? Um, the change is crazy. Uh, from OHA to OHC, I've been at both, and it is a, it's a different, it's different. Um, and not because of the curriculum or anything like that, but as you've seen, each one of us has made, made a choice to be here. Uh, an academy is, all academy students know, some students don't have a choice to come, but everyone has chosen to be here, and that kind of focus and that purpose is why this college is different than others. People go to other colleges to kind of just like coast through college. No one is here at OHC to coast. They have a goal and a mission. And so that is the biggest reason for me, is you're surrounded by people that have a mission, that they're look, looking to serve the Lord. And you, you want to work for God, surround yourself with people, that that's their goal, and that's what this does. Any other questions? Let's see. Oh, it looks like, okay, right back here again. Oh, just need, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. You just have to pray a lot and study Bible and spirit of prophecy and don't go where the spirit doesn't lead you. Okay. Um, do you ever, do you ever think or feel like you're, I mean, okay, so I know like what's super cool about this place is like everyone chooses to be here, everyone wants to be here because they want to hopefully get to really truly know Jesus. But being in that environment, does it challenge you spiritually to the fact that when you leave, your spiritual life will be like, oh, I don't have my like huge strong spiritual support anymore. And so you go downhill a little bit, or like lose that a little bit, or, or is it just such a high concentration of like strong Adventists that you don't really get the practice every single day of like helping someone dealing with like atheism? I don't know. I, I hope my question <laughs> understood makes sense, but yeah. I think of Enoch because you know he had his time alone with God when he was in his very spiritual atmosphere. And he also had those times when he went out and was witnessed to other people. And here at OH, that's why we have programs like Acts and Canvassing, 
because we have this very spiritual atmosphere where we can all grow and be together and have that support group. And then, you know, as Marcelino was saying earlier, then we go and apply it. We go canvassing, and that's when we can meet those people. And even on a Christian campus, there's always people that you can witness to. There's always people that you can be a blessing to, whether it's your fellow students or the, in the academy or even the staff. There's always a way that you can be a blessing wherever you are. God, God, give us, God gives us divine appointments here. I totally believe that. God has, has something for us each day to encourage one another, and we're all going through this battle. We all have our struggles and, and doubts, and that's, that's a big blessing is that we can be encouragements here. And like she said, canvassing and acts, you meet a lot of people with a lot of questions, and it, it definitely challenges you, but it gives you a greater reliance on God. Um, the thing about OHC is they have like, um, programs for you like acts and canvassing and what it does for you is it kind of forces you to step up into leadership and your spirituality depends on you and your walk with Christ. And if you depend on others to be your support, for sure you will fall when you go back. Because I've done it, I, I came here and I went back home and my spiritual life was gone. But I decided to come back because I wanted to be more firm in my spiritual life. And now you have to have the desire. You have to have the willingness, the determination to be able to stand firm on your faith. And as mentioned before, OHC can be a catalyst to your spiritual life. But it all depends on your choice between you and Christ. And it is, it's training us for the end times to come that when the time comes and you're tested and we're all gonna be tested according to what we can handle. And so why should you come? You should come because God calls you here. Don't come because we convince you to come here. I can convince you to come and you come and you don't like it here. It's not the best thing for you to do, but come because you love God and God calls you here. Yeah, I think the picture of uh, coming to OH and, and having a spiritual IV stuck in and, and then, you know, then you leave and the IV goes out, it's not that way. Um, the, the students here are very real students, as are the staff, and uh, life is, is very real here as well. And uh, so there, there's no hiding. You know, this is not a place to hide, but it is, it is a place where we give the Lord uh, we're paying attention to what the Lord would have us do, and he can bless that. He can really bless that in a huge way. Got a question back here, and then over here again. How long are the counseling usually? Is it like three weeks of talk and then three weeks of, of listen? Or? I, think, I think we do about six weeks of school, three weeks of canvassing. And then I don't know how, how about the summer program, but during the school year, the I think. Yeah. yeah, because uh, oh. well, anyhow, yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I don't, but Marty would know. <laughs> Marty, what's the schedule like? That's what it's like in the fall. There's three weeks, and I think it's probably four readings. It would be we have two different times in summer and in fall, and then summer is ten weeks. Summer is ten weeks. I think we have time for one more question, and and. If you right, um, I've heard this from different students and also some who've graduated. I keep hearing, don't overload your schedule. Amen. Now, I also hear, you know, of course, with any college that you really go to, they always point towards, you know, do this to graduate in four years or in two years. So from the students, how would you guys recommend really going, like, a T deciding what classes to take and keeping that in mind with your own personal spiritual life and et cetera, et cetera. How would you guys all? For me, uh, I'm pretty sure I overbooked myself this, uh, this, <laughs> this semester and I really regret it. I, I, would, I would rather uh, take less credits and actually fully comprehend what I have. Uh, just chew on it, it's like, it's like a meal. And don't take a big plateful and just swallow it. You got to eat, eat some of it and take small portions, and you get the actual nutrition out of it. 
So you want you want an education that will last. You want an education that will that will re, you will stay stick with you and that will be practical. And I would I would recommend that's why I recommend praying about your schedule, <laughs> praying about what God would have you to do, because he he's leading you here to give you true education. He's leading you here to come into a better relationship with him, and and you can't do that if you try to put uh, if you try to guide your own life if you don't listen to his guidance then it's going to be a little harder so <clears throat> numbers wise i'm taking 14 credits this semester which is a pretty standard load anywhere and yeah i have to study a lot yeah it's it's a, it's a lot of studying i it, it's it's the way college is um but if you're thinking about taking less credit so you can have more, more time for devotions or this, that, and the other, perhaps for you, you that would work. But for me, having that busy schedule pushes you to make use of the moments you have. And in some ways, the busyness is one of the biggest strengths of the school because uh, you, you learn that I can spend two hours staring at my Bible or 45 minutes actively reading and praying. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> what did you ever say? Yeah, it, it's, it's, the way, it's the way, unfortunately, our carnal man works. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. And so don't, don't skimp on your classes. Take a full load and work hard, and the Lord's going to fill up the rest. Quality is better than quantity. So take what you can handle and pray about it. For all of us, it's different. Um, we can take more than others. We can take less than others. But I just prefer quality over quantity. And, of course, our students are going to be working with their advisors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, up front here, I think now you two girls, of course, you were here last year, right? Nalo and Yamana, but the, uh, the three of you are new, and so you're just kind of getting a feeler for what you can handle here. And so that's an ongoing process, refining what you can and not, how, how big a load you can do. Okay, I see you one hand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Um, what Jay Rose is mentioning is that there's a, a somewhat modified, not totally new, but modified program for our work, uh, for students to work. We've always um, supported and, and tried to provide for work, but now we're getting, we're refining our serve. Do you want to comment, any of you, on the ethics part of the program or? So forth. Um, as previous, previously mentioned, um, OHC is not just a place to get a college degree. I'm not sure, or maybe someone didn't say that. Well, if they didn't, well, I'm saying it now. <laughs> OHC is, is not a place that you just come to get a degree in education or business or personal evangelism to say you have a degree. Um, the, the focus here is spirituality and character building because whether you have a degree or not, if your character is in alignment with Christ's character, you can go anywhere and be hired and work for the Lord. Um, a lot of people with degrees can't find a substantial place to work because their characters are not correct. And I think that the work ethics helps um, focus on that, that it's mainly about character. Education is important, but the work ethics class helps us realize that with an uh, education of book knowledge, it also needs to be an education of character, um, character reformation and, and being like Christ. And in the work ethics class, it's actually one of my favorite classes, because everyone in the college has to take that class this semester. So it's the whole college together. And um, some of the classes that we've taken have talked about integrity, um, time management, 
uh, communication in the workplace. So the work ethics class helps you in your vocational training area. Um, in the schedule, on top of having your classes and canvassing, you also have eight hours of work that you're to complete every week to help like Cheryl said, feed yourself, and also go towards your tuition and other things of that sort. Um, and you may be in the kitchen, you may be in the mechanic shop, you may be in the, um, working in agriculture, and the work ethics class helps you be more efficient and useful in that work location. Yeah, in your work setting. Um, so that's what the work ethics class does. So it really is about character formation, you know, truly learn those things that makes you an effective um, Christ-like worker. So in my th three years to Academy One College, uh, Academy works 18 hours, college works eight. Um, and I've worked construction, cafeteria, uh, automotive, agriculture. And if you look, take a look at the Gospels, you will see that so many of the parables that Jesus tells talk about work in the field and just work in general uh, to be a generalization and you have classes and you're studying and you're memorizing this that and the other i'm working in automotive this semester with pastor dale and the other kind of focus that gives you it gives you a mental break you're like i don't want to go to work i got so much studying to do but that other kind of activity that other kind of work is such a break you come back after three hours and you're like oh, wow I feel like I can study again. It's, it seems illogical, but you can find so much more work with ethics. You, you are disorganized and then you come back and realize that your work for that day is organizing all the socket sets, right? And so for the next four hours, you're like, okay, so five sixteenths, three millimeters, okay. And you can see the practical application of things you've been studying, Vesper talks and the like. And so I find that the work is the last aspect that rounds out OHC. I think well said, the principles of true education must incorporate manual and so forth. I'm being given the signal that our time is up. Do we have time for one more in the back there? Okay, right there. Last one. Okay. I don't know if this has been talked about already, but um, I heard that there is a no dating policy at OH. <laughs> what do you guys think about that? Oh, it doesn't sound like anybody's interested in that. <laughs> Anybody want to comment on that? How, um, how do you relate to that? So your question means, is there a dating policy? Or like, is dating allowed or is dating not allowed? Yeah, what do you think about it? Oh, what do I think about it? You know, maybe for, for those that are listening, um, we do have a non-dating policy here. That doesn't mean non-friends. That is uh, a, a non-social environment. This is not an anti-social environment. This is a very social environment. But in terms of just uh, locking into the whole dating scene, that does not happen here. We have counsel about that. How do you relate to that? How, what's it been like? Um, I'm in school, well, we're all in school, and you want to be able to focus, and you don't want any distractions. I mean, having a significant other is not a bad thing, but having it at the wrong time, it's like, you don't want to, you don't want to be dating someone with OHC schedule. No, <laughs> definitely not, uh-uh. But for me, I've, I've understood that there's a time for everything. There's a time and place for everything. So God, um, I've, I've, I've prayed about it, and I can wait. If it takes three years for me to wait, that's fine with me, because this is where God has called me, and this is what I need to focus on right now. And having two or three things that are my main priority, I can't do that. But just to finishing up and doing what I need to do, that's what I need to do. And if God calls me to be married, then I guess. <laughs> but here in OC, no, definitely not. If you're here looking for that, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> not here. 
Okay, we got to thank you, Nalo, for being brave. We should hear from one or two more. Okay. Um, I've been at schools where dating was allowed before, and it just creates a lot of drama <laughs> and things. So honestly, I love the policy because everyone is your brother or your sister, and it's just like family, and you don't have to worry about drama and all this kind of stuff. So it's a blessing. You know, if we're so willing to listen to Steps to Christ, Desire of Age is great controversy, why, won't we, why wouldn't we be willing to listen to counsel on relationships? Mm. So I totally believe in this policy. I've dated in high school, and it was miserable. It was so, so much drama, <laughs> and it caused a lot of division because of the thing, because the thing is we do have a busy schedule, and you won't be able to spend enough time with that person, and then there's this division, and it's just better to have this family unit of go, go, seeking one purpose, and that's to know God better and to encourage one another. And God will, in his time, pr provide you with a spouse. Um, oh. Oh. Um, wait, did I lose my train of thought? OK. Um, being at OHC, um, some of the things that we said this school does is character reformation, kind of um, helps you get to that end goal that you have, which most people want to go into ministry. And sometimes a relationship could influence what God is trying to do in your life, and you tend to shift your focus on working for the Lord and going to ministry to, oh, well, now I'm going to have a family, and now I can't go overseas anymore to do mission work because now this person, and, and, and it starts to change and shift your focus. But if you just, and not trying to be cliche, but if you just seek ye first the kingdom of God, then all else shall be added on to you. And right now, this OHC, I call it the wilderness experience. At least that's what it's been for me. I feel like Israel in the wilderness, and I'm like crying out for water. I'm like, Moses, feed me water. Like, it's just been so much just going on in character reformation. And, and until we have solidified what exactly God would have us to do in our lives and focus on, you know, growing spiritually and, of course, receiving your education, that should not come into play or into focus because it does reshift where your goal is. And we're told in the book, Message to Young People, that Satan is going to use it as a snare in these last days for young people. It's a big, big snare. You know, well, we're all Adventists here. We're all Christians, so why not? But counsel says that when you're in school, you should not be in a relationship. Just our human nature, the way we are, it's a distraction. You may say, no, I'm different. No, the, don't try to make yourself the exception. And we're like, well, there's that one exception that if, no, just, you know, follow counsel. And it's a beautiful thing when you do things God's way mm -hmm. because you don't have to hide it. And that's one thing that God's been showing me, you know, I'm trying to make this short. Um, my experience is I have dated the world's way. And like um, Daniel said, it's so miserable. It's like, ugh. You know, and it almost puts a nasty taste in your mouth. But when you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And he can give you in a, thank you, thank you. Oh, it's so sad. Um, but <laughs> when you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And he can make that an enjoyable experience if you do it his way. And, and the staff here is going to support you. You know, I hear so many stories of people that went here, and after they graduated years later, they end up getting together, and the staff goes to their weddings, and they're so supportive of it because they did it the right way. But when you do it the wrong way, the only support you have is from Satan and his host, and you don't, you don't want that type of support. So, so trust God's counsel. Trust that little old lady. She, she knows what she's saying. <laughs> so <clears throat> it is not good for man to be alone. And we are all here to get fully equipped. Part of that equipping is the spouse God has for us. But take it in the right steps. Get your education, get your life skills, and then the man shall not be alone anymore. <laughs> um, well, I was given the signal that our time is up. And so I apologize. We do have to cut it off. Um, I, would, would it be true, students, that this dating thing, at the very least, gives you an opportunity to exercise self-control in a crucial area of your life. Would that be true? Yes. OK. Hey, thank you so much, each one of you, for just your honest and open uh, statements. Please feel free to ask more questions as we mingle. But we are going to shift into our next phase. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Loving Savior, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to talk like a family openly and to hear each other, To and for those that are here uh, considering the school, to get just a, a real uh, clear take on some of the things that happen here and what life is like. I pray that your spirit 
may indeed guide and direct that those that can be here and should be here and would benefit from being here would be, and that those that would not, that you would direct them as well to some other location. But may it be again by your Spirit's leading. Thank you, and in Jesus' worthy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.